my soul loves you, Jesus. My soul loves you, Jesus. My soul loves you, Jesus. Bless his name, my soul. Seeks to please you. Come on and say it to him. My soul seeks to please you. My soul seeks to please you. Bless your name. My soul seeks to please you. My soul, it really seeks to please you. My soul seeks to please you. And that's why I'm going to bless, I'm going to bless your name, yes. Everybody who came to bless him say, yes. Everybody who loves him say, yes. Oh, yes. That's right, tell him, yes. One more time, tell him, yeah, yes. I'm going to tell him, yes. If you really believe him today, tell him, yes. Yeah. Yes to your will, yeah. Yes to your way, yeah. Yes, Lord, I'm coming your direction, Lord. Yes, Lord, not my will, but thy will. Yes, Lord, not my way, but your way. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Now come on, give God a great big praise all over this place. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Yes every day. My soul said yes. Yes to your will. Yes, Lord. Yes to your will. Oh God, we thank you today for your goodness. We come before your presence with singing. Because we know that it is you, Lord, who has made us and not we ourselves. We are the sheep of your pasture. And so, God, today we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We're thankful unto you today, Lord God, and we bless your name. For, Lord, you are really good. Hallelujah. Your mercy is really everlasting. And your truth does, hallelujah, go on to every generation. And so we thank you today in the name of Jesus. Now, God, as we've come in your presence today, Lord, oh, God, anoint us to praise you in spirit and in truth. God, our hearts are humbled before you for all of the manifold blessings that you poured out upon us. And not only is our heart and our hearts humble before you because of what you've done, but God, even our hearts are humble before you because everything that we have been brought to. God, we thank you for bringing us to the walls of our life. God, thank you for bringing us, oh God, to those points of pain 
that have caused us, oh God, not to look down any longer, but to look up. Hallelujah. Cause us to say, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. We thank you today, Lord God, because we're making decisions to let go. Hallelujah. Let go of our way. Let go of the way we think things should be done. Letting go, oh God, of our will and doing as Jesus did on the cross and say, not my will, but thy will be done. Oh God, we thank you today, oh God, for all of those who may be burdened today. Oh God, we have so many who have lost loved ones. And so we do press in in faith. And we pray, God, that you will comfort those who have experienced loss, God, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, look on Deacon H today, Lord, in the loss of his son. Oh God, look on uh, the Carlisle family in the loss, I believe, of that niece. Oh God, look, oh God, on the Woolards in the loss of that nephew today. In the name of Jesus. Comfort the hearts of your people in the name of Jesus. And God, help us not to focus on the problems that we see, not focus on the circumstances around us, oh God, but to look up and live. To live, oh God, in faith, trusting that you have already done the work. And so God, as we move forward today, we pray for our pastor. God, that you would anoint him to preach under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God, let your rain of word, oh God, come through in power. Let souls be saved, healed, and delivered today. God, anoint the praise team as well as the choir. God, let the praises go up, oh God, and let your praises, oh God, and your blessings be manifested in this house today. And God, we'll be careful to give your name not just some of the glory. Lord, we'll be careful, oh God, not to take any of the glory but God we'll be careful to give your name all of the glory all of the honor and all of the praise for it is declared in Jesus name and we give you praise now because it's all ready done now put your hands together like you believe God's already got your back hallelujah and it's already done hallelujah glory to God We've come to give him praise this morning. We've come to give him glory. Hallelujah. For the promises of God are yea and amen. If he said it, he will do it. Hallelujah. If he spoke it, he's going to bring it to pass. Hallelujah. Come on, join in with us this morning as we enter into this time of praise and worship. Those of you who can't stand, we're going to ask that you stand with us for praise and worship this morning. Promises of God are yes and amen. The promises of God, yes and amen. If He said it, He will do it. The promises of God, the promises of God, the promises of God, yes and amen. Come on, the promises, the promises of God are yes and amen. Of God, yes, and amen. If He said it. 
share with your neighbor whatever that promise is that you stand on. Whatever it is that God has promised you. Hallelujah. Come on, share it with your neighbor. Tell them what that thing is. was coming. It seemed like Christmas took forever back then. But you told your parents what you wanted. And they told you that they would get it for you. And you believed it. So you anticipated. And you looked forward with this great anticipation to Christmas morning. Because you knew that your daddy was going to keep his promise. You knew that your mama was going to keep her promise. And you were excited. Yes. We serve a God who is greater. We serve a God who when he spoke it, he had already done it. Now if you believe that today, I want you to get excited. Like you know that everything that God has promised you is coming to pass. Hallelujah. God, we trust your word. We trust your promise. knows our every need. He knows our every desire. Even those things that we haven't spoken, He knows what we have need of. We have a Father, hallelujah, who knows our name. He knows who you are today. You're not alone. You're not walking through this by yourself. Hallelujah.
want you to lift your hands in this moment. And with your mouth, with the fruit of your lips, just begin to tell him how much you love him. What he means to you. He knows your name. He knows your voice. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we bless you. Come on, lift your, lift your words. You're a great God. Thank you for an ear that hears our call. Come on, talk to him. Thank you that you're present with us in every situation. Thank you that no problem is greater than you. We bless your holy name. God, we honor your presence in this place today. The presence of the living God, the Holy One, we lift up to you. Thou who art the blesser, we thank you that you know our name. We worship you, O Holy One, and we lift up our voice. Come on here. We prophesy over our own life and declare that the promise of God shall be manifested. We wait upon you in this space. Come on. In this space of anticipation. We wait upon you, Lord, with eagerness. We come to this sanctuary with our hands lifted. We come, God, with our heart filled. We come with our spirit expecting to do, for you to do the great and wonderful thing. We come, Lord, to ask the hard thing. Come on, beloved, use your words. For you are God and you are great. You are mighty and you are awesome. We worship you and we declare before this generation and in this house that our God is able to do. Our God can do great and mighty things. We love your name. We extol you. Hey, God, we magnify the Lord greater than our situation. Thank you, Father, that you refresh us. Come on. Thank you that you renew us. We bless you, God, for repairing our brokenness. Hallelujah. And you hear me when I call. And you hear me when I call. Come on. And you hear. And you hear.
Jesus, 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 you're the greatest, hallelujah, who else would lay down his life, Jesus, 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 when we call your name, when we call your name, Jesus, Jesus, things change when we call your name, Jesus, the atmosphere changes when we call your name, Jesus, 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 there is something about your name. He knows my name. <laughs> moment. Ain't nobody talking to me. This is the worship moment. Look at somebody and say, he knows. Now look at somebody and say, he sees. Now look at somebody and say, he hears. Come on, tell God he knows. Tell somebody he sees and he hears. God's going to do about, he's going to do something about what he knows. I said, he's going to do something about what he knows. He's going to do something about what he sees and he's going to do something about what he hears. Shake somebody next to you and say, Jesus is going to work it out. Be seated in the presence of the Lord.
listen, right there. Put your hand together. Put your hand There's together. a sound to our worship. We're a hand clapping, foot stomping, tongue talking, Pentecostal church of God in Christ. Hallelujah. he knows my name hallelujah he's not going to go to the wrong address he knows your name God knows come on here God sees and God hears and because of that he's going to work it out hallelujah come on put your hands together and bless the Lord come on affirming the word Hallelujah. Well, beloved. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. I'm going to ask the ushers to prepare us now for this time of giving in the presence of the Lord. To all of our first time guests, we're delighted to have you. We are, we are committed to doing three things in this season of being with him. And that is praying till we pray through, worship till we break through, and preach till we change. And we'll, we'll, you'll see our formal program and everything else later, but look at somebody if you don't know him, say hello, I'm so glad you're here. Come on, tell him he's already worked it out. Come on, he's already worked it out. Hallelujah. There's no greater welcome than the Holy Ghost welcoming us into his presence. I'm going to ask that if you, this is your first time visiting us, I'm going to ask that you would simply stand. If this is your first time visiting us, will you just stand? We're just delighted to have you. Will you give our visitors a great God bless you? Come on, praise the Lord for all of them. Thank you so much for standing and being with us. God bless you. If I don't have a hospitality card, we seek not to embarrass anyone nor to forget anyone. We just simply want to recognize your presence. Uh, the guest of Elder and Mrs. Joe Mitchell, uh, Jordan Franklin is here from Woodstock. Will you stand up? We're delighted to have you. God bless you, sir. <laughs> Hallelujah. We praise the Lord for you and to all of our guests. To those that are watching us online, we praise the Lord for God and we thank God for what the Lord is doing. Thank God for a powerful word this morning from evangelist Bridget Floyd. Thank you, Lord. I, I want to get to the preaching because there is a word in my belly. And uh, we're just going to believe God as we are culminating this time of marriage and family this month. I want you to look at your bulletins and uh, let, let, let's do this together. 
uh, one of the members sent this to me, and I thought this was uh, so insightful that I asked to put it in the bulletin. And uh, let's read it together. It's the Ten Commandments for Loving Couples. Number one, come on. Thou shall give 100%. Number two, Thou shall treat your, na- your partner as unique individual that he or she truly is. Three, thou shall stay connected through word and deed. Four, thou shall accept change and support growth in yourself and your mate. Five, thou shall live your love. Wow. Six, thou shall share the love and fear, the work and play. Seven, Thou shall listen, listen, listen. Why did women just say, amen, Jesus, right there. Number eight, thou shall honor the subtle wisdom of the heart and listen to the powerful insights of the mind. Number nine, thou shall not be a jerk or a nag. Number 10, Thou shalt integrate the purity of spiritual love with the passion of physical love. Amen. As we, can, we culminate our time of marriage and family, our statement of marriage and family is found in the front part of this bulletin. We want you to share this as a track. I want to share with you very quickly that, this, that tomorrow, tomorrow will be a time of Elevate. We will meet with our young adults ages 18 to 35 in the Kingdom Center uh, at 715. And that's just going to be a powerful time of sharing. We just had an awesome time, and it'll be my delight to walk them through that. Also want to share with you that this coming Friday, I'm going to ask you that can to join me as I'll be preaching this Friday at the Abundant Life Church of God in Christ. Um, nope. Yeah. But this is uh, Pastor Edmund Williams, and Elder. Uh, this is his anniversary, and we're going to be at 1280 uh, Benteen Way in Southeast Atlanta. And if you would like a ride, there will be sign-up sheets in the Welcome Center, and I would love for you to come with us. I want to come and just bless the Lord and uh, be a blessing. Can I say something to you, Greater? Will you all listen to me real quickly? This has been a year of extraordinary ministry and new directions and dimensions and new areas for me as your pastor. And uh, I know that October is Pastor Appreciation Month, but somehow the Lord has orchestrated that I minister to people during this month. Amen. Amen. Okay, I need y'all to say amen. amen. I appreciate and will thank God for your support and what, and you'll hear the uh, Uh, announcement later but I just wanted to share with you that what God is doing is significant in the lives of other people and for some reason in this season he has trusted me with a word for multiple houses multiple races in different venues amen and so I want you to be as excited as I am for what God is doing through us and for others and uh, to be very supportive of that and uh, I will tell you that unless you go away, you don't know how good you got it. We take for granted, amen. We take for granted a whole lot of stuff. But unless you go away, you have no idea how good you have it. And we want to go and be a blessing to this man of God who has served and is serving where he's assigned and doing the very best where he is, amen. And the same way we've done pop-ups and we've gone to other people and encouraged those services, I want to be an encouragement to Pastor Edmund Williams and that congregation on this coming Friday. And then this coming Saturday, we will be in our first Saturday prayer, a time of being face-to-face with God. We ask you to join us Saturday at 7 a.m. It will be a powerful time. On Tuesday this week, the Voices of the Bridge will be in rehearsal because I've asked them to come and minister in song on Friday night, those that can. To all of our first time visitors, we're delighted to have you. I do want to share with you that October is our, is Pastor's Appreciation Month and we're going to talk about that, but it's also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Isn't it also Domestic Violence Month? Yeah. 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 It's Bring Your Neighbor to a McDonald's Month. It's everything, right? So what we're going to try to do 
is focus on those social things that are, that are critical. We're going to have a pink and purple day, amen? amen? So that we can celebrate those who have survived, survived breast cancer and those who have survived domestic violence. And particularly in this season that the country's in. We, 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 want to, we want to be very sensitive to everybody, amen? But I also want to tell you that Saturday, October 13th, I need every parent to write this down. I need, you not to, I need you to write it down so that you will volunteer and that you will bring your friends and neighbors. This is going to be our community outreach, and it is our trunk or treat. This is our alternative to the whole Halloween season. We moved it up this month because last month we had it scheduled for outside. The weather went bad, but these phenomenal people moved the thing in, so we had a great time, but we're going to we schedule it again. We moved it up, hopefully to coordinate with weather patterns. There's gonna be games and prizes, candy, the food pantry, prayer will be offered, but we're going to show our children a different alternative to gremlins and goblins. We're gonna show them how to have fun and have it in the context of being saved. Okay, can I just get 50 people to wake up and say, wow, yes. Yeah, 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 that's what we're gonna do. And so we're going to ask you to please volunteer. I need you to see, go to the table that's set up in the, uh, outside of the sanctuary and volunteer set up so that we can help our children in doing that. I'm going to ask uh, Elder Hamilton to come at this time and then we're going to receive the offering and then a word from the Lord. Good morning, Greater. Good morning. How y'all doing? All right, all right, okay. Uh, this, as Pastor said, is Pastor Appreciation Month. Um, our official celebration will be October 28th. We will honor Pastor doing 8, 11, and 4 p.m. services. All members are asked to give $100. The Auxiliary Department Leadership Report to Elder Humphreys and Missionary Barnett. And you'll wonder why the celebration is used in October. Well, according to our African-American traditions in the rural communities, that was harvest time. And so people had money for their crops. So we ask you to bring your crops in with the money you got for your crops to bless the pastor with $100, okay? All right. And so, and we look at it also that pastor gave so much last year with the gala. He sacrificed uh, to give last year to make sure it was nice for everybody. So we want to sacrifice for him. Like I said, he is a great pastor and teacher and motivator and friend. So this year we want to bless him like he blessed us. And so, like I say, we had a great time at the gala. We had everything was nice and pristine and perfect. And so we just should, like I say, we want to make everything nice for the pastor. Are you with me? Yeah. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Can I get an amen? Yeah. So thank you, and, and uh, like I say, comply, and let's bless our pastor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. At, at this time, we're going to stand and face the outer walls following the direction of the ushers and bring the Lord an offering. And listen, when I say this to you, will you come smiling, dancing? No, no, wait, stop, y'all, stop. I don't want you to get so churchy that giving offering is functional. Giving offering is part of worship. Because guess what? God gave you the ability, gave you strength to get something to put it in the envelope. Now, this thing could be totally different. That envelope, your text your, or to, to give through Givelify or on our what, website, you could have nothing in the bank. But because the Lord has blessed you, I'm tired of us coming to church and just punking God off like here's something. No, God, you blessed me. I could be trying to rub two nickels together, but you, you gave me money to take care of every bill, to cover everything. And watch this, even if it, and you got me to the 30th. You know what? Y'all kill me. Don't act like you ain't got no pay week. I said he got us to the 30th. You had to stretch some stuff, but touch somebody and say, tomorrow the feist. Not the first, the feist. Hallelujah. <laughs> People that have fixed incomes have to come on here. That's why I want us to celebrate what God is doing. And you, and you young folk that ain't standing up, stand on your feet. Get up. Let me tell you why y'all need to be shouting. Y'all need to be shouting because the Lord blessed your parents to feed you. If, in no, if nobody ought to be dancing down the aisles, it ought to be the people that live in your house for free. 
Amen. Please don't, don't let them think this just happened. No, the Lord made a way. When you put that plate in front or they go get that plate, say, so put that plate back and thank God that there's something in the pot. Because you, you went to get the plate and you never checked the pot. Because you really believe something is in the pot. So you just went for the plate. I'm preaching right now. I want y'all to stop going for the plate and stop and thank God for the pot. Because he didn't have to do it. So I bring you my tithe. I bring you my offering. Because you've been a blessing to me. Father, bless now and sanctify the gift and the giver. Multiply it 30, 60, and even 100 fold. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and bring the Lord in offering.
how you talk with me and oh how you tell me that I am your own you know my name you know my name you
Will you do me a favor and stand to your feet and salute this choir as they shall come into the audience. Hallelujah. As they will, come on, give them a great God bless you for the multiple times that they minister all the time. Hallelujah. No, I really want you to take a minute to thank God for our music ministry. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Just fill in wherever you can. As we stand in the presence of the Lord, I have prophetically heard this choir minister. From the worship, he knows my name. To the praise that he'll work it out. And oh, how he walks with me. God has been speaking. God has been speaking to us in this moment. Father, we thank you for this moment around your word. We pray today that you will speak so clearly and so distinctly that it is unmistakably you. Give to us, Lord, the ability to hear your, your voice. And then God cause us to break through the walls of pain, the walls of anxiety. We pray for a now a rhema word. We pray, God, for focus. And we pray that you will give us the ability to deliver what you spoke to us. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray to the glory of God. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, I want you to get your Bibles out, get your tablets. We're going to read just for a moment. But I think it is so important that you have context. Because this message to me is as pivotal and vital as any other message that we would preach. As we culminate this time of celebration of marriage and families. Last week, and we heard from so many couples about the love notes that we passed out and the couple's communion. And I want to tell you that you belong to a church that's going to minister to every part of your life. Amen. That there's going to be balance here. Amen. And so there are many faces and many experiences that make up our congregation. And as pastor, I am duty bound to speak to all of those experiences. Amen. And I said last week um, that we would have a word for those who are single or single again. It does not omit those that are married. It just simply focuses the conversation into a demographic that is growing in America, particularly around young adults who are delaying getting married. They're delaying having children. They are filled with anxiety. They are trying to figure their own lives out. And they do not want to make multiple mistakes of jumping ahead, as we talked about in our class this morning, to grab something that's convenient in lieu of what God promised. So I feel compelled as the shepherd of this house to lay a biblical and theological, and watch this, cultural and experiential foundation on how we approach either being married for the first time or for the next time and understanding what happened if it's the next time, what happened the last time. To put into perspective the fear of those who want to be in relationship, but are so frightened about the last relationship that they, they run fears that they will be in the last relationship again. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in the message translation. The reason why I need you to have your Bibles and read it, because I'm going to read, I had selected scriptures, but I'm going to read the entire chapter. And I want you to hear it in the spirit. Now getting down to the question you asked in your letter to me, first, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly, but only within a certain context. It's good for a man to have a wife. 
and for a woman to have a husband. So I want to lay out biblically and theologically that we, the church of God in Christ, believe that marriage is constituted in God's original thought between a man and a woman. And while we believe in the civil rights of all humanity, we believe that we are so constructed that the word of the Lord through his divine and intention has caused man and woman to constitute what is pleasing in his sight. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balance of fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. With deviance everywhere. Kids can't have cell phones, and if they, if they use, they type in the wrong thing, then they miss, a, a, they miss a word by a letter, then they're locked into porn and pop-ups. And so you can sit here and look as though that's not the truth, but I'm here to tell you that our kids are struggling with how to stay pure. They have so much going on, that's so much information. They know more than we ever knew at their age. They are pressured to be something and to perform and, and to feel a way. And they have not even gotten their own sea legs about who they are in terms of their own identity. They are struggling with their sexual identity, trying to figure out who am I. They are, they, watch this, they are surviving mol molestation, molesters and fiends and pedophiles and people who have crushed their lives at an early age and have framed how they see God. So the next time you want to talk to somebody about their sexual orientation or about their, their whatever you think is not normal, then I dare you to spend some time to get to know the person before you judge the action. That's, that's why I didn't, want no, I didn't want the choir up here because I don't want nobody looking. I, I want to preach at you and tell you that until you have walked a mile in somebody's shoes, you can't be judging where they are. Oh, God. Until you figured it out, until you know the pain, and until we watch this, you equip people with the ability to overcome. That's why I'm a teaching priest, because hollering, squalling, running around the church without teaching you the biblical principles of the word of God means absolutely nothing. You got to have more than information. You need some application. How do I apply that to my life? Because what God wants for me, I want what God wants. Can I talk to about a hundred people who will say, I want what God wants. I, I've tried getting what I want and I've tried working it out, but it never works out because everything I want somehow falls apart in my hand. It eludes me, but I want what God wants. I want, but I need to be disciplined enough to know what he wants. I need to hear his word. And so look at Paul as they questioned him. This, this, this Corinthian church were questioning him about what do we do about this? And so he's responding on being married and being single. And so he says that a marriage, the marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife, the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Um. Read, preacher. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. Because if your marriage is only relying upon your performance in the bed, then as great as it may be for 2.5 seconds. You got to live after the bed. You can't lure somebody into a lifelong commitment based upon promises and fantasies. You cannot build a relationship based upon emotions and lust on deviance and attraction. 
But you have to have a relationship that is solidly built upon an understanding of who God is and what God expects from the relationship that he's ordained. And let me help you with this. God instituted marriage before he instituted anything else. Of the three great institutions in the world of, watch this, the family, the, uh, the, the, the uh, marriage is the first institution, family is the second, and government is the third. Yeah. And so before God did anything with family and government, he brought man and woman together. Notice what he says. He says it's not the place to stand up for rights, meaning that you can't be married and hold out and use sex as a leverage to your partner till you get your own way. I need... Deacons, there's only two of y'all today. Everybody else at the game. I need y'all. That's right. Can I need that Baptist preach pastor? That's what I need. Give me that South Carolina Baptist. This is a, a tough message. But watch this. Marriage is a decision to serve one another, whether in or out of the bed. Abstaining from sex is permissible for a period of time if both of you agree to it. And if not for the purposes of prayer and fasting, but only for such times. So they were saying, wait a minute. We can't perform in the marital context of physical affection because we need to be pure for God. Paul says, no, you now that you're married, you are to take care of one another. I'm trying to make sure that we do this with kids here. Amen. He says, because that's as much as a part of your worship. Yeah, it's part of the worship. Now, now you, if you've got a negative context to the very purity of God, then you can't make what God made wonderful. You can degrade it and you can poison it and you can say that that's this or that. But I'm here to tell you in the original context of how God made man and woman, that was good. Then you come back together for a certain time. Paul says, don't get so spiritual that you forget one another. He says, don't be so deep that the Lord told you as a wife or as a husband that we're not going to have relations for 90 days because God is putting me on a fast. Use a lie. God didn't talk to you. God didn't speak to you. Because watch this. Had God said some, he would have talked to your spouse too. Can y'all help me with this? He, he would have said something. Come on here. That's why you got to watch folk that always got a word from the Lord that is not, watch this, backed up by the word of God. So take a look at this. He says, sometimes, he says, then come back together. Satan has an, um, an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. I'm not, I understand, commanding these periods of abstinence. And he says, this is not coming from me, only providing my best counsel if you choose to accept it. Sometimes I wish everyone were single like me. Here we go. Paul says, a simpler life in many ways. But celibacy is not for everyone and any more, any more than marriage is. So I want to balance this. So marriage and singleness are both gifts of God. Everybody, no matter how bad you want to be married, everybody is not called to that union. Everyone is not gifted in that grace. But that doesn't make single people second-class citizens. It doesn't make you also ran. It's just, watch this, there's a gift for singleness and there's a gift for marriage. Paul says, uh, he says, the simple thing is to be single. He says, but if you can't contain yourself, then watch this. The proper sexual relationship is in the confines of marriage. God gives the gift of the single life to some, the gift of the married life to others. Verse 8 and 9, I do, though, tell the unmarried and widows that singleness might be the best thing for them, as it has been for me. But if they can't manage their desires and emotions, they should by all means go ahead and get married. The difficulties of marriage are preferable by, by far to sexually torture, to a sexually tortured life as a 
a single. And if you're married, stay married. This is the master's command, not mine. If a wife should leave her husband, she must either remain single or else come back and make things right with him. And a husband has no right to get rid of his wife. For the rest of you who are in mixed marriages, Christians married to non-Christians, we have no explicit command from the master. So this is what I say to you must do. If you are, if you are a man with a wife, who, has, who is not a believer, but who still wants to live with you, hold on to her. If you're a woman with a husband who is not a believer, but wants to live with you, hold on to him. The unbelieving husband shares to an extent in the holiness of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is likewise touched by the holiness of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be left out. As it is, they are also included in the spiritual purposes of God. And he's saying, they said, now that I know Jesus, I got to get rid of you. Because you don't know Jesus. Unfortunately, we have the same issues going on in this culture. Now that I'm saved and you ain't saved, the Lord's going to send me a saved man or a saved woman. Use a lie. You married them. So let's see how good God is in you. Because he says, now turn your marriage into an opportunity to witness. Now, I am not condoning if you getting beat, abused, and kicked around. You are not to stay male or female. Because there are male abusers and female abusers. So we're not talking about threats of your life. But we're just simply saying that does not disqualify them from the marriage conversation. Is that what the Bible says? He says, on the other hand, if your unbelieving spouse walks out, you got to let him or her go. You don't have to hold on desperately. God has called us to make the best of it as peacefully as we can. You never know, wife. The way you handle this might bring your husband not only back to, God, to you, but to God. You never know, husband. The way you handle this might bring your wife not only back to you, but to God. And don't be wishing you were someplace else with someone else. I just thought, I thought let the text preach. Lord, if I had a husband like that, you got the one you got. Man, if I had a wife like that, no, you got the one you got. I'm going to do this in a minute. You're going to see that God has given you power, watch this, to cultivate what you want. I said to cultivate what you want. Because the test has got to be on character, not on cosmetics. You ever wonder how did he wind up with her? Like, what did he do? Because she found character. She can get him a new grill. She can buy him, come on here, some gators. She can put him on a treadmill. She can give him a better diet. She can send him to the barber. She can send him to the dentist. But you can't change his heart. Only God can do that. And while you're looking for the wow and the bang, you better make sure you look at the heart. Because if the heart ain't right, then no matter how good it looks to you, it ain't right either. Mm. Why are you non-Jewish at the time of your call? Don't become a Jew. Being Jewish isn't the point. The real, the real, um, the really important thing is obeying God's call, following his command. Stay where you are and, where, and when God called your name. Were you a slave? Slavery is no roadblock to obeying and believing. I don't mean that you're stuck and you can't leave. If you have a chance at freedom, go ahead and take it. I'm simply trying to point out that under your new master, you're going to experience a marvelous freedom you would have never dreamed of. On the other hand, if you were free when Christ called you, you will experience delightful enslavement to God you would never have dreamed of. He, now, Paul is making a cultural point here because I got to make sure y'all understand this. 
because I am not advocating slavery. Paul needed to say some stuff to push the gospel through culturally. And he's saying that if you're a slave, then don't look to be free. No, if you're a slave, you ought to be free. That's why I push against the text. But then he makes the point, he makes the metaphor and says, if you're free, then you need to become a slave to God. Because he's making the more important point that our relationship with God is more important than anything. Are we here? I'm going to let y'all go, but you got to hear the word. All of you, slave and free, both, were once held hostage in a sinful society. Then a huge sum was paid out for your ransom. So please don't, out of the old habit, slip back into being or doing whatever el what everyone else tells you. Friends, stay where you were called to be. God is there. Hold the high ground with him at your side. The master did not give explicit directions regarding virgins, but as one of much experience in the mercy of the master and loyal to him all in all loyal to him all the way, you can trust my counsel. Because of the current pressures on us from all sides, I think it would probably be best to stay just as you are. Are you married? Stay married. Are you unmarried? Don't get married. But there's certainly no sin in getting married, whether you're a virgin or not. All I'm saying is that when you marry, you take on additional stress in an already stressful time. And I want to spare you if possible. So you want to be married? Your choice in being married will determine 97% of your happiness or your misery. It's who you invite into your life is not just the individual. It's everybody and everything attached to that individual. So brother, she looks good. But go and check out her mama. Let me deal with the mama first. Because when you look at the mama, there's a preview of coming attractions. Then look at the whole family. Because if they have issues, she was born in those issues. She's been affected by those issues. And you're marrying the issues. Come on, it's equal opportunity. He looks good. But find out what's the relationship between him and his mama. Because if he don't treat his mama right, he ain't going to treat you right. And if, and watch this, and you meet him and he has children. And if he don't take care of his own kid, he ain't going to take care of none of yours. You cannot marry the potential of a person. You got to marry the reality of the person. They, well, you know, I think, I think with a few things, I could, I could really make them. That ain't your job to make them. They already came made. Now the only thing you got to do is accept or keep it moving. There's a whole lot of stuff that looks good while you're driving by and it's out on the lawn for a sale. It'll make you slow down to see what it is until you get up close. And then you decide, you know what? I think we better keep moving. You don't, watch this. This is why courting, dating is one thing, but courting is something totally different. Date is the introduction, it's the interview, it's what you like, what's your favorite color, what's your favorite meal, ba 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 ba. I'm gonna get to it in a minute. But courting means you gotta date the whole family. Cause you need to know what things look like before things look like that for you. Ooh. 
Are we okay? He, he says in the 29th verse, I do, not, I do want to point out, friends, that the time is of, of the essence. There is no time to waste, so don't complicate your lives unnecessarily. Keep it simple. In marriage, grief, joy, whatever. Even in ordinary things, your daily routines of shopping and so on, deal as sparingly as possible with the things of the world that the world thrust on you. This world, as you see it, is on its way out. I want you to live as free of complications as possible. When you're unmarried, you're free to concentrate on simply pleasing the master. Marriage involves you in all the nuts and bolts of domestic life and in wanting to please your spouse, leading to so many more demands on your attention. The time and energy that married people spend on caring for, caring for and nurturing each other, the unmarried can spend in becoming whole and holy instruments of God. I'm trying to be helpful and make it easy as possible for you, not make things harder. All I want is for you to be able to develop a way of life in which you can spend plenty of time together with the master without a lot of distractions. If any man, verse 36, that's why I got to read the whole chapter. If any man has a woman friend to whom he is loyal but never intended to marry, having decided to serve God as single and then changes his mind deciding he should marry her, he should go ahead and marry her. It is no sin. It's not even a step down from celibacy, as some would say. On the other hand, if a man is comfortable in his decision for a single life in service to God and in its entirety, his own conviction and not imposed on him by others, he ought to stick with it. Marriage is spiritually and morally right and not inferior to singleness in any way. Although, as I indicated early, because of the times we live in, I do, pass, for pastoral reasons, encourage singleness. A wife must stay with her husband as long as he lives. If he dies, she is free to marry anyone she chooses. She will, of course, want to marry a believer and have the blessing of the master. By, by now you know that I think she's better off staying single. The master, in my opinion, thinks so also. I wanted you to hear Paul before you heard me. And while I agree with his apostolic observations, I take issue with some of it because our culture has changed. You got to realize that scripture must be viewed in the light also of culture. Because what happened then is not happening now. And so I want to share with you, and I won't call their names, but I've been reading some articles and I saw some stuff posted in social media. And I saw one from one of our millennials. I saw one from a single mom and I saw one from a widower. And I, I've included them if I can get to their pieces in this particular sermon. And so notice the text here that Paul responds. But this young adult says, for the past couple of weeks, the topic of love has been coming to me a lot through Bible studies, discussions with friends, church services, and devotions I've been reading. What's interesting is that I don't believe the coincidence of the topic has to do anything with falling for anyone romantically, but falling completely in love with God. I remember at the beginning of 2018, I felt that this would be, the, the, would be my year of quote unquote love. Being 25, I'm thinking that the feeling I had meant that I was ready to settle down with someone, but even realizing that at this moment, God meant something even greater, which was falling in love with him. Thank you, Lord, for the breakthrough you provided in my life this year. I love you more and more every day, and I'm hoping to provide encouragement to any singles out there feeling lonely. Seek God in this season of your singleness. You are not alone. Let me tell you why that registered to me. Because this person, this young adult, got it. Now, while we raise our kids culturally, and, and listen, this is not a sexist message, it's just the truth. While we raise our girls to have that perfect wedding day, dreams of gowns and fantastic bridesmaids and you name it, and they live with that dream and there is nothing wrong with it. What I love about this particular writing is that this young woman said, before I can wholly be someone else's, I must singularly be God's. 
Because if, watch this, look at the word, if I'm single, that's why I said it's a blessing. If I'm single, then I bring my wholeness to wherever I go. And I am not dependent upon the emotional energy, the financial flow, the social acceptability of anybody because I am single. I am not single not having someone. I am singularly committed to God. I am singularly committed to myself. And watch this. I got to cut through the field. But whatever you are not for you, you cannot expect somebody else to be for you. Please don't go hooking up with folks because there's something missing in you and you need them to make you whole. I'm here to kill that lie where two halves come together and they whole. Use a lie. You need to be whole. Ain't no halvesies here. Touch somebody say, ain't no halvesies. Get yourself to come up. Come on, get yourself together. You got to bring it all. The day in which we live, you cannot just bring half of you. And if you, and watch this, the reason why I love the writing is because she makes the point that I've got to be connected to God. Because what I teach is that if you're going to be connected to God, Kent, would you do me a favor? Sister Darlene, would you come here? Yo, I need y'all up for a quick second. I did this before last year, but I want to show you the thing one more time. Face each other. Don't hold her yet, dog. <laughs> Darlene, walk up and he... <laughs> the point that the writer makes, a member of our church, and she says this whole thing about being single, is that if I am broken, if I am divided, then when I get with somebody, then I can only give them half of me, and half of me is all of me, because I got nothing left for myself. So now I'm in a relationship where I'm more drained by what I've given, and they're in a relationship with me because they only brought half of themselves. This is Matthew 25. That they will, we didn't bring enough oil. Do y'all read the Bible? Y'all should have said, amen. Now, hey, that's a good one, Pastor. Matthew 25. They said, give us some of your oil because we've run out. Can I help you with something? If you want to be married, you can't run out before the wedding. You, you can't exhaust yourself because you're only looking at a wedding and you need to be thinking about a marriage. Matter of fact, culturally, the way we do weddings is jacked up. We spend more money on weddings and ain't got a down payment for a house. We want everybody there. We want to throw a big party when you need to tell everybody, cough up a grand and give them a year to work on it so that their wedding gift to you is $50,000 so that you can put a down payment on a banging home and then invite them into your banging home in the backyard, serve them some hot dogs and juice, tell them thank you so much because your marriage is more important than your show. So, so, so let me get there because I'm going to let you go watch this. Um, so with the writer, what she wrote, the thing got to me because I preached this, that Kent can't love Darlene with the love that Kent has because it's not enough. What he has is physical, erotic, romantic, social, financial, but all that stuff is temporary. If he doesn't have a relationship with God, then he'll never touch her heart, but he'll keep buying her toys. He'll give her stuff, he'll make her feel good, but he never moves her heart because the way God made her was that God made him for her. And matter of fact, God said, Kent, since I can't be there, I want you to tell Darlene how much I love her. She needs to know that I love her by the way you love her. All right. Are y'all here? Come on, Pastor. So if you, if you want to be married, you got to know that even in the dating situation, in the courting time, you got to know how much God loves you. 
And while you're looking at him and looking at her and talking about, ooh, I'm in love, you need to say, God, you really love me because you gave somebody, and you put somebody in my life that's lighting me up that makes me love you more than them, and then they get the benefits of you loving God. So do me a favor, hold your hands up to God. God loves Kent. Yes. Kent has to receive God's love. Yes. And the love of God's got to flow through Kent yes. to Darlene. Yes. So that Darlene can say, I know God loves me because he gave me him. So now, because we don't manufacture enough love to love one another. That's why love is a spiritual concept. We like each other until you get on my nerves. Come on, y'all. Will you tell the truth? We put up one. I need a real good house to preach in. I like you as long as you're doing something for me. But the minute you get on my nerves, we need a break. We need to go see somebody, something wrong with you. Because we cannot manufacture, Jared, enough love to love one another. If we don't receive the love of God, you got nothing to give to somebody. But watch this, a couple of years of great togetherness, wonderful trips until you run out of money or something else breaks. So when... God loves him, yes. he then, come on, put it out your hand, loves her, and watch this. This stays together because she received God's love, and she loves her husband based upon the love that God has given to her. So now he knows that God loves him because he gave him her. So when they say, does God love you, he said, have you seen my wife? Did we get it? All right, Kent. Yeah, you, you got a house and you got a condo. You, go, you got your own rooms, Doc. Okay. So, so watch this. So, so watch this. Can you say single? If you're married, can you say single? Because the point of the matter is God wants you to be singularly his before you can get all of yourself to anyone because we don't have the stamina to do that. So singleness is a gift from God. Vaughn Roberts writes this, but what if I don't think I have the gift of singleness? I don't think that it's easy being on my own and I long to be married. Does that mean I'm experiencing second best? And the answer is no. And I wanna lift this off of single people in this church and watching us uh, on our stream. Stop letting people, and married people particularly, make you feel bad, and your parents and grandfolk, and you get to, get to gatherings. You ain't married yet, you still married? You asking me, am I married yet? I'm trying to figure, you still married? Because I can't figure out why you so involved in my singleness when you should be caught up in your marriage. That's why I don't get why married folk got a whole lot of stuff to say to single people. Because the real deal is you need to be caught up in what you're in and not trying to judge somebody because they do or don't have somebody. Having somebody in your life is not necessarily a gift from God. It could be a burden of your own flesh. Am I preaching? So when Paul speaks of singleness as a gift, he isn't speaking of a particular ability of some people to have to be content uh, single, but rather he's talking about the state of mind, the state of single. As long as you have it, it's a gift from God, just as marriage will be a gift of God when you receive it. So one, what we do in our culture, in the black culture, we try to make something better. Single folk try to prove to married people you better off than they are. And married folk try to prove to single people you better off than, than they are. And both, and then if the body of Christ, singleness and married is the gift of God. And it's based upon your ability to walk that gift out. So let me tell you about stages of dating. And I preach this all the time without timelines. 
This is for you, and, and, and watch this, and not y'all as a couple. This is for you as a person. You gotta do four things if you're gonna date. The first thing is discover. Say discover. discover. You gotta go through a period of discovery. And, and you know what that is? That's you and um, you and then the world around you. You gotta discover you. You gotta know who you are. There are too many people getting married and have no clue who they are. And as a result, they want somebody else to tell them. You want somebody else to frame it. You got to know who you are in Christ. You got to know who you are as a person. And then watch this. Present who you are to people you may be interested in. So watch this. People can receive you for who you are. Compliment you for who you are. For your intelligence. And not, watch this, objectify you. Oh, you, you know, you're a pretty woman. And you got and your body banging and all of that, right? Or watch this. He got a job. He make money. No, I want to deal with women, too, because y'all objectify men. This, men objectify sexually. Y'all objectify financially. Be, you know, uh-uh. I can't, I can't deal with no broke man. No, baby, you broke. Come on, woman. Come on, women. Look at another woman and say, he can't afford me. He can't afford me. You, you ain't ask him a question. You don't know his name. You, you don't know what he's trying to be, his dreams. You just be like, how much you make? Oh, no, baby, no, no, no. You got to be this high to ride this ride. No, no, baby, no, no, no. You, you ain't. No, no, you don't make enough. Oh, oh. But I got somebody I can introduce you to. The world you create must accommodate others comfortably. Discover this. Discover both compatible, whether you are compatible and compassionate. You got to determine whether there's compatibility. Not because you admire something in their personality. Then after you discover, this is what I want to tell you. You got to investigate what you discovered. You got to test what you discovered about you. This is never about somebody else. So if y'all were waiting for a message about go ahead and get them, Pastor, this message is get you. Because you've got to watch this investigate about your own discovery, about your own sense of self, that you will always be you and you are never looking for someone to make you something that you are not or want to be and they cannot do it. You've got to investigate the fact that nobody has the, uh, no, nobody has the obligation to make you happy. I want to be married because I just want to be happy. Wrong reason. Eh. Because it is not the job of somebody else to make you happy. When they come into your life, they will add happiness to your life. But baby, you got to have your own happiness. You can't be depressed forever. I'm, come on here. That's too draining on anybody to make you feel good about you. Are we okay? Second one is, is, is investigate. You gotta, you gotta take a look at what's going on. Test you, test what you discovered about yourself and then the world. T do the tolerance, do the life rhythm test, do the passion test. Do they have passion about anything? Not just about passion about being with you, but do you ever talk about anything else? Do you know that they have dreams, goals? Are you, are you lit up by what their purpose may be? And if you're not lit up by their purpose, then that chemistry is not for you. Do not waste your life or somebody else's life when you're not going to invest in their life. Come on here. Everybody that comes into your life, I'm talking to singles now, everybody that comes into your life, even if they leave your life, your life ought to be better because they were there. Can somebody say amen? Because watch this, you can do bad. All right, you can do bad by yourself. You gotta investigate their visions, their dreams, compatibilities, their sacrifices, and their selfishness. Every time we go out, you never reach for the bill. Now, here, here we go. This is my cultural stuff. But it's pretty bad 
for women to be driving men around. It's my cultural stuff. I got daughters. For women to be right, well, he ain't got a car, so I got to go get him. Oh, baby, you don't make enough. You don't make enough. Oh. You got too many stories. I lost my debit card. And I didn't get paid this week. And it's lie after lie. Can you pick me up? Can you loan me a little something? Can I help the singles? Women, if you're lending money to the dude you're dating, you gonna pay for the man you marry. Am I doing all right, Doc? Come on, y'all, stay with me. I'm, I, I, I gotta preach this thing out. You gotta investigate. You gotta know the real job and that this ain't catfish. You got to know they go to a real place. You got to know there's a real W-2. Come on here, a real W-9. You got to know something about them. You, and watch this, you need to know their debt to income ratio. Because if you marry them, you marry their credit score. You done worked your way through school, you got all this going, and then they coming up talking about, baby, I'm just, I had a little challenge in my life, so I only got a 500, but you know, with, with, with your 800, I think we could do all right. If, there, if the relationship is imbalanced, now I'm sorry, this may be chauvinistic, this may be old fashioned, but the way I was raised, come on here, that you got to be a man. You got to open the door. You got to show up on time. You got to pick up a bill. You got to look into the future. You got to hand your woman some mad money. It's outside the budget, baby. This is just for you. Because if you never get any mad money during the dating season, you be mad in the marriage. You got to investigate. Watch this. Is what you see really what is? You gotta investigate, you gotta discover, and then you gotta say, is, what, is this really the real deal? You gotta ask hard questions. You gotta do a deep dive into what's missing in you and them. You gotta check their mental, physical, emotional, social, and financial capacity to live out your life. Does this person have enough depth to live out my life? Y'all ready to go home? I need a little bit more energy, y'all. You, you meet them and they look nice and you, go, and you keep going to the movies, the matinees. You don't know whether you can take them into a five-star dining room. You don't know whether they know the salad for, come on here, from the dessert. Story I was told by my brother years ago, we had this wonderful restaurant called The Three Coins. And him and his boys decided they wanted to be, live large one night, and they went to The Three Coins, and they ordered lobsters and all this stuff. And so they brought lobsters, and they brought, you know, at that time, brought the, uh, yeah, the thing that cracks it. Put, they put the thing on the table, and the boy said, where are the nuts? That was the time when they would bring you finger bowls after, come on here, and, and you would dip your fingers into hot water with lemon and, you, you know, with a linen towel just to prepare you for the next course. Brought the finger bowls and one of the brothers picked it up and started drinking it with his pinkies up. You see, my point is, come on, watch this. You can meet somebody in the ghetto while you're living, come on here, in the suburbs but if you like them in the ghetto you better teach them where you're going or you better like ghetto living
And I'm not throwing off on nobody. I'm just saying, you can't marry, you can't date a hoopty and think you're marrying a Benz. You gotta ask some hard questions. Then you gotta prove, you gotta prove character because that's, that, that, that's the rest of you. And then the, the rest of them you can fix, but you can't fix their character. You can't change their deal. You, you, you've got to deal with their character. And watch this. And you've got to figure out whether they have the character to influence your life. If you're always leading in the relationship, something wrong. Now listen, I'm not suggesting that men should not lead. But I'm saying, watch this. Women should lead also thought leaders, creative leaders. Because today's woman got a whole lot to say, and they have a whole lot more information. I'm going to let y'all go, so let me cut through the field. So I want to say this. If you want to be married, that's a good thing. That's a God thing. But you got to look at the pool from which you're fishing. Studies have now that more African-American women have more undergrad and postgrad degrees than the men they're married. They speak in languages and more languages than the people they're dating. You ready for this, mother? They're making more money. If you hook up with a man or a woman, but I'm dealing with men now, you hook up with a man who is inferior and feels less than because you make more than, that ain't your man. Now, can I talk to some real men? If you love her, you want her to make all the money in the world. <laughs> Baby, make the money. Hey, I got dinner at home. When you walk in, your bath waters run. What do you need? I got rose petals in the tub. Make the money, girl. Do your thing. Go shopping. Come on, roll that banker. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, baby, you bad. You better learn how to roll with this thing. Single <laughs> and you can't get these, you can't, people, can I help you with this? That postage stamps can't celebrate billboards. You a billboard and you're dating a postage stamp. And you're trying to figure out how come we're not clicking. Because you a billboard. And the postage stamp can only celebrate another postage stamp. A three by five can't celebrate an eight by 10. Because then what you're creating inside of the relationship is competition instead of being complimentary. I know, I know I'm preaching. I know I'm preaching. You gotta figure out, you gotta figure out how, if the person you're dating, if you wanna be married, are they high maintenance? Because if they high maintenance, you better know it before you say, I do. Because you will wake up saying, I do wish I'd have kept my mouth shut. But you can't all of a sudden marry a high maintenance man, a high maintenance woman, marry them and then try to reduce them so that they then will stop their momentum so that you, they move faster than you, they're, they're more high maintenance to you emotionally. You got to know what you got before you because you can't change it when you got it. You, gotta be, you have to be prepared to volunteer your life for their benefit. You wanna be married? You gotta volunteer your life. Because here's what Paul says, if you're gonna be married, then everything now changes. The focus is on your spouse. And I wanna say this to you single people who've got all these wonderful ambitions. Travel. See the world. Have great experiences. Figure out your bucket list. And when you get tired, then get married. But don't get married to say, I will the world with my spouse. Because guess what? They may not be a globetrotter. They may have never left the six blocks in they, where they grew up. You talking about Paris and they still stuck where they were 40 years ago. Oh, y'all. Say this. If you're not ready, don't do it. 
Don't let people pressure you. Don't let folk put you in. Don't let anybody put you in a situation where you feel compelled to please people and you know in your gut, this just ain't it. And this is going to be a hard one. Because in the African American community, most African American women who are educated, multiple degreed, have multiple disciplines, having a hard time finding equally qualified men. I ain't thrown off, I'm just, I'm just the prophet today. And particularly here in this Atlanta area. You gotta know You got to know. Just because it's buff and black. Don't mean that it's compatible for you. On both sides. You can't get married and find out. That there are proclivities outside of your covenant. And then you got to be ready to outside of your comfort zone. Because the statistics say in black America that most men, black men, there's a large segment that is on parole, on probation, Come on, y'all. It's under the court system. And I'm not saying because they had a hard time, they're disqualified. I'm just saying you got a small pool to deal with. And your marriage should not be missions. Your marriage can't be a missionary where you're taking on a project to rehabilitate someone or you feel emotionally obligated to make that person something that you believe they can be. That's not your job. God has assigned somebody to your life to make to your happiness and to cause you to be ecstatic about his love. And then you got a BYO happiness. Bring your own. You got to bring your own ha I'm so serious about this. People are trying to get with folk, and then they say, nah. If you hear that in your dating experience, say to them, hey, meet me at the local Publix, in some place public, and say to them, it was nice knowing you. I'm only happy because I'm here. I know I'm preaching. If you only happy because I showed up, first of all, that's unfair to the person that came into your life because that's too much energy to make one person happy. No, no, we got to be happy. Now you're blamed for everything that they are and are not. You're blamed because the weather went wrong. If something's bad. No. It is not your responsibility to make other people happy. And in the church, we teach folk, oh, you know, you got to love and show. And yes, we have to serve and be so we are never called to create someone's world so that they can be okay. Because if you leave their world, then they're suicidal. Something's wrong with that. That was jacked up before you walked into that world. That's why you got to discover, investigate, prove, and then commit. You can only commit to what you can prove. You feel. You got to know your worth. I said, you got to know your worth. I said, you got to know your worth. So Jesus says, don't cast your pearls before swine. And lastly, the things God gave man before he gave him a woman. So get married, ladies, and it's a good thing. Men, it's a good thing. We'll pray for you in a minute and we're gone. 
But God gave man a job. Adam, here you go, tend the garden. He gave him a place. It's eaten. So before the man asks you, will you, find out whether they have and do they have a place. Because living with your mama ain't the place. And then the third thing he gave him was the ability to cultivate, to grow. Does the man or the woman you seek to, do they have the ability, the creative ability to cause you to grow? Because if they can't help you in growing, then they're not the ones for you. And then the fourth thing God gave man before he gave him me, he's gave him a word. Do they have any relationship with God? Not do they go to church. Do they have a real relationship with God? Because let me help you with something. It's the Holy Ghost that will stop them from cussing you out. It's the Holy Ghost that will stop them from putting their hand on you. It's the Holy Ghost that will stop them from being verbally abusive, physically abusive, power struggle. And if you don't have God in you, come on here, then you've got nothing to turn that anger off. I'm, this is marriage and family month, and I, and I got to deal with this. And then you need to get the book, His Needs, Her Needs. If you're going to get married, I want you to read this book. Because it talks about the five desires of, of the female and the, her needs is that she needs affection. She needs intimate conversation. Trusting you totally. Honesty and openness. She needs financial security. She needs a good husband and a good father to be committed to their family. So if you these needs, then you don't need her. Amen. Amen. Equal opportunity, his needs. He needs sexual fulfillment. He needs a recreational partner. He needs a good-looking, physical, attracting wife. He needs peace and quiet. Women talk 30,000 words a day. Studies show that men only got words. So men are operating in a 20,000 word deficit. <laughs> the Bible says, if you have any questions, husband at home, now, I took that totally out of context, but I wasn't going to let her punk me off. <laughs> if you want to be married, you got to figure out whether they're physically ready for you. Are they going to marry you and then die in a month? Come on, y'all. You, you got to know, you, you, you don't need no blood test. Now, you need a whole body scan. What's going on with you? Are they emotionally ready for you? Are they financially ready for you? When you date Boaz, you're dating Boaz family because Boaz got family, and it'll cause you to meet crazy and dumb. and selfish and wonder why he acts like that you got to look at it all I know this ain't gonna make y'all shout but I want you to think so lastly I close single mom writes this just because you love the idea of marriage doesn't mean that you're ready for it if he doesn't communicate now how does a ring improve that situation if the ring is your biggest priority, you're not ready for marriage. Always be authentic. If you can't be real when you're dating him or her, and he or she may not like the real you at all. So never send your representative. Be you. Amen? Appreciate their efforts. Sometimes silence is bliss. Stop nagging because they just might need to talk. And then I want to say this to that when your mate is men, she's always nagging, 
Nagging is a symptom that she's uncovered. People complain about the things that hurt them. And if your if your person you want to be with is with quote unquote nagging, there's a part of her that's uncovered. And it is incumbent upon the man to cover your spouse so that you have peace and quiet. Seek wise counsel. Sister girl, everything. If you ain't standing on a firm foundation, which is Jesus, sit down. You ain't ready to stand with someone else because your hope is built on nothing. This is the single mom. Honesty is the glue that holds all communication together in a marriage. Withholding sex is not biblical. Man cannot live by bread alone, and in Atlanta, there are too many women willing to supply. Stop trying to keep him or her to yourself. And watch this, he or she had a life before you came along. You've got, before you get married, you got to know all of it. And you got to know everybody that's connected to them. And then be comfortable in your place. Because if you're intimidated by the life of you, then you don't need to be with that person. Intimacy can't happen if you're sharing it with the world. You have to be exclusive. Let your love speak for itself. And then the message to the parents. There's been so much investment that you've made, pains, tears, and sacrifices, that if you play who call babe, respect it, don't hurt them. And if you can't respect that, then don't play with it. It's not that you, that you, it's not that you are not liked. It's the fact that you've missed what's been given to you. When you, as a parent, give your child to someone to marry, then respect the investment that's been. Yeah. Can I say something, parents? Yeah. We put too much in our children. Too much investment to let somebody else ruin it. No, oh, come on, y'all. It, that, that's to, then give me the tuition money back. Come on here. It's school back. We've invested too much in our children to let some knucklehead come along and say something to ruin that investment. Lastly, here's the message to the mothers. I'll finish the rest on Wednesday. Don't mother. If you are raising sons, then you can't mother your man because you're ruining that boy for his wife because he's not going to look for a woman that lights him up. He's going to look for a mama to continue what mama does. While that may make you feel like Queen B you are ruining a relationship because it's difficult, watch this, to replace any man's mama that's been a good mom. And it's difficult, come on here, equal side, to replace any daughter's father that's been a good father. So you don't want to be the one. And if you're married, then be in your marriage, not your parents' marriage. This has just been a tough preaching, but I, it's the truth. You can't continue somebody else's marriage. You got to be in your own. Well, this is the way my mama did. This is the way my mama and your daddy ain't here. So how are we going to do it? Who are you? Who am I? How do we make this work? How do we have a signature and identity to our own relationship that is separate and distinct from the one we grew up in or the one that we saw? So let me close. If you desire to be married, it is of God. There's nothing wrong with it. If you desire to be single, there is nothing wrong with it. But you can't be single and skanky. I know what audience I'm preaching to. And older folk, don't, don't get... I'm good. I know what I'm doing. Because Paul says that the whole conversation and the whole issue of intimacy should be housed in the context of Now don't look at, don't look, look at anybody funny, because guess what? You have developed soul ties if you're single. It doesn't mean that you had any intimacy with someone, it's just the fact that you gave them your emotions. You handed them what you were thinking. You have to undo that. 
because you've got to solely be God's before you can fully be someone else's. That original writing was powerful. I'm going to give you the third one on Wednesday because that talks about the struggle that singleness is hard because you have to love God and to wait on God and not to replace God with somebody else. That's Wednesday. You need to be here for that because too many things we've replaced God with. People and things. Amen. If you desire to male, female, married again, I want you to come from where you are now to this altar. I want to pray. I want to pray. And guess what I'm praying for? I'm praying for your mates. So th this, this ain't a message for salvation. I'm praying for your, I ain't praying for your man, I'm praying for your mates. I ain't praying for your boo thing. I'm praying for your mates. No, I'm so serious about that. I don't, if you, if you only want to be up here to date, then you need to go sit down. But if you desire to be married, if you, and this is a, this is a good thing. The same way we did communion, couples communion, I want to pray for you because this is a good thing. And I don't care how old you are and it, well, I ain't been married in so long, but if that's your desire, then you need to be up here because there's nothing wrong with it. Because guess what? Who wants to die? Who wants to live their lives alone? And I'm a, but I'm gonna tell you this, outside of praying, you're gonna have to do something. The first thing you have to do is you gotta make sure that you are single. Because shh, nobody else can fit in your life. No sin. Have you prepared? I know what you want, but have you prepared? Have you really prepared with all the things that I've said to you? You got more work to do before somebody ever comes into your life. You got to do. This is work that must be done in you. You got to love you for you. And then watch this. You got to love God even if it doesn't happen. You got to stop emotionally holding God hostage because you're not married. And then I'm going to say this to you, and I could be wrong, but you're not married now because it's your choice not to be married. See, we don't preach that. No, I want to be, no, it's your desire to be married. It's just not your choice to be married. What do you mean, Pastor? That there is somebody out there right now, D, that wants, but you've got to choose. You've got to say, that this is right for me. Just because they have a desire for you to be with them, they might not be the right person for you. Since there's, but since there's more women here than men, I want to say this to you. You might be their answer. Now, come on. You might be their one, but they're not your one. So then you're still two. And the Bible says the two shall be one. You can't always be some man's answer and never the man's question. You can't be some woman's answer, brothers, and never their question. You've got to make room in your own life. You've got to determine that. Come on, Lord, send me somebody. God, I want to be single with you. Because if you don't get that part right, then you will have what Paul says, complications for the rest of your life. Let's pray. Father, we pray now for these that are at the altar and for those that are sitting and watching us over our stream. We thank you for the sincere desire to have someone in our lives. But God, we've lived in long enough not to have anyone. Lord, more than being connected and coupled and linked, we desire to be singularly yours. So everything that competes with our life in you, Lord, we pray now that you set it aside. We pray that you take it out. We pray that you give us the ability and the strength to be solely yours. It's for times that others and other things 
and other priorities were more important than you. Forgive us for the clutter that we have collected from past relationships, from past things. Forgive us for the fear that we have about stepping out into places that are uncomfortable. So relying upon what we want and not what you promised. Lord, eliminate the anxiety to grab something that's comfortable, but not something that's purposeful. We pray in the name of Jesus that you begin to craft that man for these women, those women, and those women for these men. We pray today because you know our name. You understand our life. And then God, I pray that you give them heart space. Heal every brokenness. Heal the past hurt. God, deliver them from suspicion and deliver them, God, for sin. Deliver them from low energy. Father, I pray today that you begin to work a work in these and then prepare them for the person that you crafted to walk out their lives for the rest of their lives. Father, we get rid of, come on here, we pray that you deal with my soul. Open your mouth. My soul ties. Open your mouth. Things that we've tied our soul to, our intellect, our will, and our emotion, experiences and people and places and events. Father, in the name of Jesus, undo the soul tie and heal the heart. Jesus, revive the spirit. Lord, renew the mind. And today, God, we bring to you our earnest desire. For your word is declared. Mm that whatsoever we shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the midst of the sea and shall not doubt, but believe those things that you say, we shall have whatsoever ye saith. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things ye desire when ye pray, believe that you have received them and ye shall have them. So now Lord, specifically, as pastor of this church, I ask you craft mates for these thy people, for those who have prepared themselves, those who have singularly given themselves to you. Now, Lord, we pray a compliment to that preparation. And we thank you that you will do it. I pray that you close every door that should never be opened. And I pray that you open doors that should have never been closed. I pray, God, that you reconstruct emotions and will you rekindle and that you manufacture and God that you help us in every area of our lives that of these might be pleasing to you we pray in Jesus name and we thank you now amen and amen how many of you believe that prayer come on let's praise the Lord return to your seat hallelujah hallelujah bless you. Man, we ain't shouting today, huh? That's why we got to shout early. Because sometimes the word of God is not, you can't shout on this. On this. It was tight. I want you to be happy. I want you to live in the fullness of God's plan. But I want you to have a biblical base for it. Not being emotional, but being biblical. Watch this. And having the very thing that God has promised for you, I believe that God will do it. Listen, we got to go, but I want you to realize that I need everyone to register to vote. If you have moved into this state and you have not registered, you need, amen. Greater Community ought to be a church that 100% of our participants have registered and voted. It is critically important in these times. Ain't no sense in praying for God to do something different and you have not been to the polls. Amen? And so that, that's a balance. Second thing I want to do, that if you desire to be a member of this church, and I haven't done this in a while, and I'm not sure when I'm going to do it again, I will, but I, my thing is I keep wanting to feed you. I want you to be connected, but I want you to know what you're connected to. I don't want a good service and a, a good sermon and a great song to make that the reason why you join our church. Committed going someplace, that we have a very clear vision.
that we have a mandate of the Holy Ghost to bring kingdom to community. If you would like a voter registration card, please raise your hands and uh, Brother Odell will make sure that you get one or the ushers will assist them, however we do that. But we just please keep your hand up high because we want to make sure that you have that area that you do that. If you'd like to be a part of greater community, the doors of the church are open for membership. We'd love to have you. We thank God for you. We're standing. Praise the Lord. Maybe what we can do, Brother Doug, is take the voter registration cards right at the door and make sure that we're at the doors. Okay. Okay, come on, come on, come on, family. I'm sorry. I thought we was waiting. Come on. Beloved, before we go, our family's growing. I want to make sure that we get your full names. Timothy Houston. Cantrice Houston. Deja McMillan. And Beta Houston. We are delighted to have this family with us from Minnesota. They were with, oh, sorry. Hi, how you doing, what's your name? Heather Skanes DeVold. Say that one more time. Heather Skanes DeVold. S Heather S Skanes. Skanes DeVold. DeVold. We're delighted to have you. And where are you from? From Birmingham. Birmingham, Alabama. We're done with us in service. We're going to be better because you're with us. At the end of this service, there will be a room and our member service reps will meet you right over across the hall in a blue room to fill out some information. And then we will meet, we will meet together uh, at a time appointed to go through your call of God's and how we can partner together to get what God wants to accomplish in this earth done. And we're so delighted to have you. On behalf of Greater Community Church of God in Christ, I welcome you to the fellowship of the saints and I bless God for your membership here. Come on, family. Thank God for them. Right on your call. You may return to your seats. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. May God's desire upon your life be manifested. May you know that his call is genuine. This is real. Come on with me. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. And the Lord cause his face to smile upon you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you in your labor, your laughter, and in your leisure. Until we meet again, the blessing.